Welcome to the Dakota Live podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, manager research professionals, and other important players in the industry who will help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out our website at dakota.com to learn more about our services. Before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. This content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota. Not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval, support, or recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. Well, I am thrilled to introduce our audience today to John Brecker and Jackie Rantanen from Hamilton Lane. John and Jackie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you for being here. It's really a pleasure. I know you didn't have to come too far uh, to get to the studios, but nonetheless, we're grateful that you're here uh, spending time with us and our audience. Uh, We have a lot of questions to ask you both, but before we get started, I'm going to quickly read your biographies for our audience. Hamilton Lane is one of the largest private market investment firms globally, providing innovative solutions to institutional and private wealth investors around the world. Dedicated exclusively to private markets and investing for more than 30 years, the firm currently employs nearly 700 professionals operating in offices throughout North America, Europe, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East. Hamilton Lane has over $903 billion in assets under management and supervision, composed of $120 billion of discretionary assets and nearly $783 billion in non-discretionary assets as of December 31st, 2023. Hamilton Lane specializes in building flexible investment programs that provide clients with access to the full spectrum of private market strategies, sectors, and geographies. John Becker is a managing director on the client solutions team, where he is responsible for leading the business development group in the Midwest, as well as in the insurance channel. Prior to joining Hamilton Lane in 2012, John spent more than five years with Turner Investments, more recently as a director and principal with the U.S. and Canada institutional team. Previously, he was a financial advisor with Virginia Asset Management and Waddle and Reed, where he worked with high net worth families and small businesses. John received a BS in business administration with a concentration in finance from the Robbins School of Business at the University of Richmond. He is a chartered alternatives investment analyst. Jackie Rantanen is head of investor solutions with Hamilton Lane's Evergreen Portfolio Management Team, where she is responsible for leading the investor solutions function with a focus on the continued expansion of the firm's growing retail platform. Jackie also serves as a member of the investment, responsible investment, and executive committees. Jackie began her career with Hamilton Lane on the fund investment team. She has held roles in relationship management, public relations, marketing teams, and previously led the global product team. Prior to joining Hamilton Lane in 1997, Jackie was a corporate finance analyst for Comcast Corporation. Previously, she was a member of the chemical division's financial analyst department for Sunoco. Jackie received an MBA from Villanova University and a BS from Drexel University. Again, thank you for both for being here and congratulations on both of your success. Thank you. It's really nice to hear that and particularly a Drexel University graduate. Uh, near and dear to my heart as a professor <laughs> at Drexel, um, I'll have to get your experiences off camera when uh, when this is wrapped up, but yeah, thank you again for being here. Well, Jackie, for some background for our audience, can you help us set the stage with Hamilton Lane's uh, evergreen strategies? Sure. Where does it sit within the organization? Sure, well, think about all of the things that you said in terms of describing Hamilton Lane and what we do, right? We've been investing solely in the private markets for over three decades. And our our focus really is providing access points for investors into this 
complicated, challenging market that is private markets. And that's what the evergreen strategies really represent, an extension of that. Evergreen funds are structures that are really set up to really allow a broader set of investors access into the private markets. You know, private markets have been limited in many cases to institutional investors. A lot of the way that they work, the minimums, the the administrative burden, you know, some of the aspects of it. And, and evergreen structures are, are, are really meant to counter that. So when you look at what Hamilton Lane is doing, we're working with a whole host of investors. The evergreen um, structures really allow us to broaden that. Interesting. Well, I look forward to digging more into those strategies as we go forward. Before we do, though, let's go back to Market Street. So when you were at Drexel <laughs> University, I am always curious because uh, when I was in undergraduate, I, the, I think the only criteria I had on my resume was that I was CPR certified. So I had no <laughs> idea what direction I was going in, um, n- let alone manager research, asset allocation, and ultimately investment management. How did you find your way into the industry? I'm a proud Drexel grad, proud Philly gal. So, you know, I don't think I ever had the plans to be very far from home. I mean, I should say I'm the youngest of nine children. So even <laughs> even going to Drexel was a bit of, you know, uh, how can I get a great education with a practical element? Um, and, and, and that's really what happened for me. I mean, Drexel was a great experience for me. I thought the co-op program really set me up to be able to have some real working experience, test a little bit where my interests were, and really open up some doorways to some, you know, as you read my bio, some local companies. And so I started at Sunoco. It really was a analyst program, very much similar to a co-op program. It was corporate finance related, so it got me some really good experience. I leveraged that for what was a relatable but different experience with Comcast. At the time, this was, you know, the mid-90s, Comcast was a cable company. Um, But I was helping with the team that helped to finance all the cable property acquisitions. It was just before they were buying QVC and expanding some content when I was there. If you can believe it, they were actually working on um, the cable modem at the time, which (laughs) sounds like a really long time ago, but it was. And so it was an exciting time. Again, still corporate finance related. Um, And I had an opportunity to join Hamilton Lane. I didn't know what private equity was, and no one I knew did. It was 1997. So um, fortunately, they were open to hiring people without that specific experience. And so, you know, it's really about taking opportunities, uh, a lot of hard work, but but really wanting to continue to learn and focus and, and uh, grow. And so that's what led me there. At Hamilton Lane, obviously, I've done a lot of different things. You know, 27 years, um, it sounds like you're at one place for a long time, but I've done so many different jobs and really had the experience to grow my career with a company that was innovating and leading in an industry that was evolving and changing and, and continues to do so. Well, as one of nine, I should be asking you about team building and co- and conflict management. Yeah, that, that um, might unbelievable. be true. <laughs> yeah, that you, I know. You've been able to, uh, I mean, as one of that, it's so interesting. I could ask you all about those questions growing up. Um, John, so, so tell us about Hamilton Lean. H- how does it differentiate itself from other investment firms? One of the questions I'm, I'm sure Jackie asks uh, her GP partner, your GP partners is, you know, what's, what's the competitive edge? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's a question we get all the time, right? And certainly in, as the private markets have grown, certainly since I've been there 12 years, uh, we get this question a lot, and it's it's a point of you know that we need to stress with our clients uh, and our GP partners and the like. So I think it really comes down to three main points. Uh, Robert is one is our work with our clients, and that all starts with their clients, the needs, and those initial conversations that we're having and my colleagues are having with those clients and partners. What do they need out of the private markets? What do they want? How do they want to access it? And then coming back to Hamilton Lane as a solutions provider, trying to put together the best solution possible for them. The second point, really getting onto the platform itself, is as Jackie's mentioned, you mentioned in, in the introductions as well, we sit in a very fortunate position to manage over $900 billion. That's very important in the private markets to see the deal flow, not only on the fund side, but on the co-investment the secondary side as well. And we have a huge team that helps diligence all of those investment opportunities, but also focusing quite a bit on portfolio construction, something we'll talk about, I think, a little bit later. I think last, but certainly not least, is around data and technology. 
it's been a big driver uh, of the success at the firm and something that we believe in strongly. We have invested in over 15 different fin financial technology companies off our own balance sheet, all with the express purpose to help our clients experience in the private markets or help us manage the private markets funds a little bit better, whether it be operationally, technology, or different access points. We're fortunate to have a database of over 57,000 different funds, a whole host of uh, private markets companies that we track and follow, helps us make better investment decisions, help us educate our clients in terms of what they should expect out of the market, um, and have an opinion on what's going on in the market at this current time. Well, could you take us back to Richmond? Yeah, sure. So since yeah. we went back to Philly, uh, let's go back to Richmond. Yes. What was your journey into the industry like and what ultimately took you on this path? Yeah, I think something you mentioned earlier about coming out of uh, senior year in Richmond, I was a finance major. Uh, everything was about investment banking and, you know, or corporate finance, one of the, n no offense, obviously, Jackie, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> those two things for me, you know, didn't really pique my interest and I was fortunate enough to, uh, find my way into the financial advising space uh, and, and to find a really good mentor uh, in that initial work. To me, the financial advising space is a great one. Uh, it's, a, it's a job and a role that I love sitting around kitchen tables, um, sitting with small business owners, trying to help them sort out what they should do financially to help them achieve their goals. Similar role to what I do today, uh, which is sort of full circle. I did that for five years. Uh, my wife and I wanted to get back to the Philly area. Um, and decided one to get over to the institutional space. Um, landed at Turner Investments, working for a great team there. Uh, a couple of people that really helped build my career um, over time, getting to learn the industry, every, doing everything from answering RFPs to binding books and uh, everything in between, uh, making phone calls and eventually meeting with clients. Um, had a great run there. And really, uh, my wife's background is in investment banking and private markets. And was fortunate enough uh, just about 12 years ago to meet some people at Hamilton Lane uh, who had a, a desire to bring on somebody with my background and, and to help build out the Midwest in Canada at the time. And so was fortunate enough uh, back in 2012 to start. Uh, been there ever since and working with clients, which has been an amazing run. And it's been uh, a great place to be, a great place to raise a family for, for me and my wife. One thing I noticed in preparing for this interview is that education and educational materials really resonates throughout the whole firm. So John, in your role today, can you talk to us about how does education get put into practice? It is such a huge part of everything that we do at Hamilton Lane. Um, for us, sitting on that database, having the technology, looking at market trends, themes is so vital. I think one of the things that private markets has not done really well over time is have transparency, have real data behind how to make investment decisions. I think our asset class lives in a world where we love to talk about the latest fund, the latest deal, but what we don't talk about is portfolio construction and the implications of those portfolio construction decisions. And so a lot of the conversations that we have initially with clients is about everything from what is private markets, though less so today, um, to how do secondaries fit in? How do co-investments fit in? How should we build a portfolio? And honestly, a lot of myth busting that we like to do, and it all comes back to relying on that data to either prove or disprove things that we hear in the market. And, and I think that's a really good spot for us to sit in. Um, being an advocate for the industry as a whole. Jackie, one of those myths is that uh, the perception, I should say, that private equity is inherently riskier than public equities. And, and it would be interesting, I think, for our audience to better understand why Hamilton Lane believes that doesn't always match up with reality. Yeah, I mean, it, you look at the data and there's so many elements of risk. And so, you know, maybe it's no surprise, although we find that people sometimes uh, are surprised. Just look at the number of opportunities, for example. You know, the opportunity set in the public markets is shrinking. Today in the U.S., there are half the number of listed companies as there were two decades ago. On the private side, the number of uh, private companies is large and growing. And so, you know, I think for, for those who think that private markets are just, a, you know, small companies and there aren't very many of them, not true. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the opportunity set, that's really important. You think about the number of companies that you can invest in. Again, look at the public markets and the private markets performance comparisons. The private markets, both equity and credit, have outperformed their the public um, comparables for 
each of the last vintage years in the, in the, in the last two decades. Um, so there's a number of different things that you can look at. I think the other thing, again, comparing publics to privates, look at the Russell 2000. 40% of Russell 2000 companies had negative earnings. I mean, imagine if you said that of a private markets portfolio, people would say, I can't do that. Look at the S&P 500. I mean, you know, it's old news now, people talking about the S&P 7, really saying that, you know, seven companies are driving that index. That's 1% of the index driving the performance. Again, if you compare that to the to the uh, a private markets portfolio, you see it's much more broad-based. So, I mean, there's a lot of different elements of risk, and we encourage people to look at them. We encourage people to understand the data. But what we're trying to do is just that. Show it. What's your question? Let's look at it. And so those are just some of the examples. That's interesting. John, one of those elements of risk is liquidity. So how are you educating your clients as to, you know, the, the, the liquidity premium that is potentially sure. available as it relates to private market investing? I think one of the things that we always stress to clients is private equity and private markets is a long-term asset class. There's no way around it. The reason that the stats that Jackie mentioned about how long this asset class is outperformed for is the governance model. In the fact that the general partners can go in, you know, build these companies, manage these companies, sell them at a rate that's outperforming the public market peers over the last two decades, that doesn't come without trade-offs, liquidity being one of them. Now, I would say if you rewind the clock 10, 15, 20 years and look at the choices that you would have in private equity, you know, it has vastly grown over the last two, three decades to where you have more choice of how to approach the private markets in total, whether that be through closed-end fund, evergreen funds, but also the emergence of co-investments secondaries. And so I think when we talk to clients about how to build a portfolio, it's not only just what's your return benchmark, you know, if, if it's the Russell 3000 plus a couple hundred basis points, that's one question. We need to understand that. But we also need to understand the liquidity elements, the risk elements, um, their volatility metrics that we want to incorporate into the portfolio. Because I can take a, a, a public pension that needs to pay out a certain percentage of their, their balance over and compare that to an insurance company with a 30 or 40 or 50 year time horizon. Those are two very different portfolios in, in terms of the needs of liquidity. So that's a huge piece of it. Now, I think when it looks at allocations, right? It's generally been 10, 15, 20% generally. I think with the emergence of a lot of uh, more investor-friendly structures across institutional and private wealth, you can start to see those allocations tick up a little bit more um, as those structures become a little bit more, you know, amenable to, to real-world client uh, needs. That's helpful, John. Thank you for sharing that. Jackie, I'm going to ask you to set the stage again. Uh, one of the reasons I was delayed in getting you these questions is because I had to read a 92-page 2024 market overview. I wasn't kidding, over 90 pages. Education is real at Hamilton Lane. Um, and, and in the opening, uh, Hamilton Lane intriguingly compares the current private market environment uh, to the narrative of Hamlet. Um, so uh, interesting, how do you help investors navigate this Hamlet-like environment of uncertainty and, and make confident investment decisions? Obviously, uh, Hamlet is known as having a, you know an esoteric crisis. So how do investors think about managing that risk that's uh, that's perceivable. Well, the Hamlet choice was obviously purposeful because there are so many questions right now. And, you know, we, we really boil it down to like to invest or not to invest. Mm -hmm. And I think all kinds of investors are asking those questions. And whether it's, you know, natural skepticism or it's fear-based because of uncertainty that's happening in, you know, the world more broadly or uncertainty because there's uh, there's a lack of familiarity with the private markets. I think our goal is to come back to the data and the information and really um, allow investors to look at the private markets much more kind of objectively and in a similar fashion, obviously not exactly the same as the public markets. And so it's really about showing information and, you know, 
busting some of those myths and sharing perspective. I think, you know, if you look at, and you clearly have, our market overview, you see that it's full of, of data. And I think, you know, the punchline is that now is the time to invest, that, uh, that the data would support the uh, place that private markets exposure has in a well-built, well-diversified portfolio and doing so with a thoughtful um, approach to portfolio construction. So, so that's really what we do. You know, we try to share the perspective, we try to share the information, and then, and then we provide um, opportunities for access. One of the things that we always stress about is not trying to time markets, right? It, even more so in private markets, they're impossible to time. And so just when you think it might be the perfect time, if that ever does exist, you may not be able to take advantage of that. And so I think for us, uh, we're preaching consistency in terms of pacing, in terms of investments to make sure that right. we don't try to catch a falling knife or try to top out at, at any one given time. Uh, it makes sense given the long-term objectives. It sounds like not only of your strategies, but your clients as well. So you have all of this data, all of this information. How do you go about selecting these high conviction investment themes then for your portfolios? The most important thing is really kind of understanding the market. You know, John said it, I've said it, you know, the market is vast in terms of the opportunity set. And so our objective is to really um, build portfolios that meet client needs. So whether it is, you know, our commingled funds that we're creating or a bespoke account for a client. It's understanding what the objective is and then really working with the opportunity set to build that. You know, you have a top-down, bottom-up approach, if you will, guidelines and, and a strategic plan that sets out to meet those objectives and then the tactical, practical day in and day out. And so, you know, we really, we really are comprehensive. We really do focus on guidelines, but it's always about what are the objectives of this portfolio and then how do we use the opportunity set that is in the market to, to really kind of build that. I think it's really important to be able to have that broad range of opportunity set to then execute. So once you've identified that you know client objective, can you take us through what it looks like then selecting your GP partners? What does that typical manager underwriting process look like when it, when it actually kind of, kind of you have to sit down, right. look at the manager, look at their right. characteristics, who they are as investment partners potentially, and then making the decision. First and foremost, the important thing is to know that we welcome the opportunity to look at every type of investment out there. And so remember, our investment teams are looking across different strategies, different investment types. So we cover the entirety of the private markets from a strategy perspective, and we do invest through primaries, secondaries, and co-invests. So that's our focus. We're trying to see everything. Um, we have teams that have the expertise. And so, you know, one of the, one of the and, and teams around the world too. So one of the things is we see the opportunities and the teams will, will do a, an efficient like first screen. And if it's not a fit, it'll be a quick no. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that we recognize is the partnership is so important. And so if we believe that this opportunity is not right for us for right now, we'll tell the general partners so that they can go and kind of find other partners. And then it's really digging in. It's an iterative process. The investment teams are doing that initial screening, bringing it to investment committee for an approval to go to go further or to, to let it go. Um, and, and then and then if the, they do a deep dive, it's it's the things that you would expect. It's really understanding the team and their depth of experience, their cohesion, their approach, their governance, all of those elements. It's about the kind of strategy and sector. And so, you know, th this is a, about um, value creation and growth. And so, you know, how have they done it in the past? And does it do, does this make sense today? Can we um, can we see that they've actually built companies in ways that show revenue and EBITDA growth versus, you know, um, you know, just multiple expansion. And so all of the elements, um, I think a big piece of the puzzle is what we've touched on a few times, that data and technology. Our investment teams work as one team in terms of sharing data, sharing information. So when an opportunity comes in, there's a quick reference point of what do we know? How can we how can we kind of connect this opportunity with what we know about this general partner, this sometimes even this asset? 
um, and this strategy. So it's, um, you know, it's about uh, digging in and underwriting really at the investment level. It's about understanding the team and it's about having a view on the sector and strategy. So what does the mix of assets then typically look like as it relates to your private market opportunities? Uh, there's no typical. Um, and I think that's important. Uh, again, think about um, think about the strategies. You know, there's equities, but then within equities, there's buyout, there's growth, there's venture, there's credit, there's, you know, uh, real assets, there's infrastructure. So the strategies bring with them different profiles, different, um, you know, deployment, liquidity aspects. So all of that is important. Back to what does this portfolio need? Typically, there's a mix. Um, there's a mix of different access points. So there's there may be primaries, secondaries, and co-investments. And then there's typically a mix of, of um, different types of strategies, equities, credit, uh, real assets. But it depends on what's the objective, what's the time frame, and, what, and how is this fitting into a broader portfolio. I think for us, having the all of those kind of tools at our disposal is what's important. And it all comes together. Those tools are then be- uh, then used to build or construct a portfolio. So could you talk to us about portfolio construction, particularly from the lens of a, a retail investor? And, you know, given that that's been an active area of opportunity for you all, how are you thinking about portfolio construction as it relates to these client objectives? So when you think about the retail investors, you know, they are... Uh, I would say, severely under allocated Mm -hmm. to the private markets, right? For a whole host of reasons, right? Inaccessible, all of the things that are difficult. I mean, interestingly, if you look at kind of the private wealth universe, so think families, family offices, uh, high net worth, they they control almost the same amount of capital as institutional investors, but they have, they only account for 16% of the private markets AUM. So just in terms of context, they really have very little. So I think first and foremost, it's about getting that access. We talked about at the beginning, evergreens are one structure that are that are really kind of purpose built for this market. And a, a lot of what you're seeing in these kind of early days of evergreen is creating core holdings for these uh, for these investors. So allowing them to start a portfolio build with a diversified uh, uh, exposure that is, you know, allowing a, a program to be built. So I think that first and foremost, it's, you know, getting a, a, an anchor, if you will, a core holding that is well diversified, but then allowing that optionality for different strategies to customize a portfolio. So you think about a kind of core private equity portfolio, and then being able to have the optionality to, you know, maybe add some credit or add some infrastructure or add some real estate. I think that's kind of the portfolio construction um, uh, approach that we see unfolding for the private wealth uh, market. But today it's really just getting started and giving them uh, the access points. And we've been talking about data and technology a few times, kind of touching on it. And you had mentioned, John, some investments that the firm has made in this regard. Could you expand on the use of data and technology, not just from an investment perspective, so portfolio construction, but but thinking about the client, those objectives, as you said, under allocated. So there's this, you know, kind of need to build up this repository of information that's going to need to be available. For clients, you can bucket some of the things that we're that we've done in terms of it, technology investments into a couple. One, talking about analytics and transparency, we have you know our, our platform around Cobalt that you know gives clients the ability to slice and dice their private markets data, run theories around pacing, run theories about market um, you know trends, and and sort of view that through our lens in terms of that database and that data set. Putting that in their hands is important. Um, others around reporting transparency, making sure that they know what they own in their private markets down to the asset level, which is important for a lot of groups, but certainly for those that are maybe more ESG or SRI sensitive to know exactly what's in their portfolio. What do I own? What exposure do I have to Western Europe or the, uh, or the, or the Asia Pacific region? That's important and, and certainly answers to questions that would have taken a number of hours in terms of going through PDF files uh, on their ex- So if we can make that easier and more transparent for our clients, that's very impactful. The other part of it is, you know, what else can we do inter- internally within our own operations to make things 
faster, easier, mm -hmm. better. And that's everything from the subscription process, which to date is still mm -hmm. PDFs <laughs> and missed check boxes and, um, and all of those sort of issues that seem like they should have been solved decades ago. We're trying to help solve that with those investments. And for us, it's important for us to make an equity investment, to be a strategic partner to those groups so that we can help guide them along the way. Again, going back to the advocacy of being in the private markets and being a leader in that. So everything from you know those subscription documents to tokenization and, and other sort of access points within the private markets to help expand that through the use of technology. That's really core and very important for what we do as a firm and the innovation factor that is so very, very core to us and has been for a long time. John, what are some of the questions that you're getting from your insurance clients today? Uh, a lot about rates and insurance and, and private credit. That is certainly um, number one. I, I think that is sort of first and foremost for a lot of our clients um, outside of sort of regulatory issues that sort of keep coming up with the, with the NEIC, which we're staying on top of. And sort of how do they make more and better efficient pathways into the private markets? Um, you know, the, the insurance landscape is a, is a vast one where it's very, very large insurers that often have asset management firms. Those are great. Some smaller insurers that need help and need help accessing to the private markets. And so they're trying to figure out how do we do that? How does it work inside of our own program? Um, and then, you know, how do we make best use of technology data? We talked about reporting. Reporting is a huge issue in the insurance landscape. And so we engage a lot with our insurance clients around technology sort of arming them with more tools and and uh, and resources to help them make better investment decisions on that side. And then obviously, how do they leverage the Hamilton Lane platform? Jackie, how does Hamilton Lane define responsible investments? A risk framework, really. Um, all investments have risks. Understanding them is really important. Obviously, most people think about the financial risks, and we would expand that to think about the risks an investment might have um, with regards to the environment, social elements, governance obviously is, is an important component. And so for us, it's embedded into all of the underwriting that our investments teams do to have a view on uh, how the investment interacts in, in the world more broadly and how it might. And, and by, by doing that, by understanding the risks, it allows us to make specific decisions, whether that's a risk we're willing to take or not take, whether that's a risk that um, you know, doesn't align appropriately with uh, specific investors' objectives. It just gives us more information to work with. So we think it's really important. So, you know, having the risk framework, being accountable to having it and being accountable to reporting on it. We also think that responsible investing means engaging, you know, engaging with our partners, um, engaging with leaders in the industry around uh tracking, reporting, and uh, monitoring the risks of investing, um, and then being good stewards. Mm -hmm. And so sharing perspective, uh, demanding, um, you know, information and metrics from uh, from the broader kind of general partner community, all of that we think is, is part of it. So responsible investing is active, um, and, and we think it's important for the industry. John, how do your clients define responsible investing? Just given the political climate, it uh, feels a little bit like the tide. It comes in and out. Uh, we're a little bit out right now. So I'm just curious from those conversations you're having with clients, uh, the risk framework makes a, a lot of sense. Is that how they're seeing it as well? Yes. On the risk framework, I would say the view from sort of being tied in or out, I, I think is probably what you know we see in a lot of trade publications. I think though, the views at a very micro level for each individual client largely haven't changed. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if you were concerned about ESG or SRI issues before, you know, five years ago, you probably still are now. Um, and maybe you're getting more questions about from your constituents about where do we sit on certain issues. But I think for us, you know, it's that conversation up front, like I talked about uh, at the beginning, what is, where do you want to take risk? And is that a risk that you're concerned about? If so, how far down is that risk? Is that we want to avoid certain sectors because they conflict with what we're doing? Um, is it we want to avoid certain companies? We want to avoid certain areas? Great. Then let's talk about that up front. When we're constructing the portfolios, Jackie's, Jackie mentioned, trying to understand what that general partner does and does really well. And if that's a good match for that client or not. Sometimes the answer is no. 
And that's totally fine. And then I think very much on the back end through the use of technology, uh, through a reporting technology, and even sort of further on the impact lens through our partnership with Novata, it's important to know what you own. And so that you can, can confidently sit in front of you, whatever constituent base you have, whether it's a university, a foundation, insurance company, and answer specific questions about what do you own? Um, because I think, you know, that lack of transparency, certainly in the private markets, does not help any conversation, whether you want more restrictions or less. And so I think that that transparency certainly helps answers a lot of questions. So in these same conversations, how are you communicating what the future of private investments look like? Do you <laughs> take the crystal, crystal ball? Is the crystal ball right? in? Is yeah. it in your over? Is it in the uh, carry on? It, it, it is. It is. It's right <laughs> below the desk. Um, okay. <laughs> now, I, look, I think, you know, there's a number of tailwinds to, to the asset class. Jackie talked about the performance that will continue to, we hope, uh, will continue to persist over time. So we're getting a lot more you know, opportunities uh, for investment, as Jackie mentioned, the number of companies staying private for longer is a trend. Um, I think we are getting a lot more interest from clients, not only private wealth clients, but also institutional clients that are either continuing their allocations or increasing them. And I think from the general partner community, we're having a number, uh, an increasing amount of opportunity to invest in different ways, which means that for us, is sitting in our seat, portfolio construction and data and information just becomes that much more important every single day that we live it. And so I think what we would expect is allocations to continue to increase. Um, we have a, a colleague of ours that says it should be 50%, see if we get there, um, of portfolios. And I think because of the performance, because of the way that, that a lot of these investments are managed, I think that that trend will continue for a while, at least we hope, but we may be biased. Jackie, how about 2024? Uh, a quote that I often use in the beginning of the year is there are years that ask questions and years that answer. So what do you and the firm believe this year is gonna turn into? Is, is it gonna be a year where we get more answers or are we gonna come out of this year with more questions as it relates to private markets? There are certainly a lot of questions right now. And so, you know, our executive co-chairman said uh, at, at uh, one of our big client events recently that this is one of the toughest environments he's ever seen and he, he's been at it since the, since the beginning. There's so much uncertainty. Predictions are difficult. Um, whether you think about, um, you know, the, the, the remaining uncertainty with inflation and interest rates, you know, that's so baseline to the investing uh, landscape. I think that, um, you know, important to acknowledge that there are major elections around the world that are, you know, causing uncertainty. I heard a stat, I don't know if it's exactly correct, but directionally, that 50% of the world's population will vote this year on a major election. That's pretty significant. So I think it's those, it's that backdrop that leads me to say, we'll have some answers. Um, I think that, you know, it, the, the interest rate inflation recession question is less noisy than it was before. I saw this morning that the latest um, consensus is no recession here in the U.S. And so I think those things settling down are really supporting the increase in activity that we're starting to see. And so I don't think we'll be, um, we'll be uh, questionless uh, as we go forward, but I think that some of these major questions will be answered. I think, um, you know, uh, kind of resolving some uncertainty, giving people some confidence in terms of moving forward. I mean, I would also say that times of uncertainty are not terrible times to invest. They may be uncomfortable times to invest, but but we think that this will be a year of, you know, some significant answers um, and hopefully some continued kind of information frameworks and support for people to make good investment decisions. Well, you've both been with Hamilton Lane for 12 years and 27 years respectively. That is nice to hear. It's not often that you see that type of tenure at firms these days. Uh, it's a lot easier to move around. And we see even some of our guests who have been on the show, but have since left. So I'm, I'm just curious, in 12 and 27 years, what's a decision that you're proud of professionally that you've made in your tenure at Hamilton Lane? I think it is, you know, I'm, I'm proud of a lot of the candor that we've been able to have with our clients, um, we and all of us, and have been in so many different conference rooms, and 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 certainly have heard so many different pitches and sales pitches, and and I think you know to truly be able to connect with clients um, to help 
them do their jobs better, provide better for their constituents, but also the ability to look at clients and go, you know what, we're not the right fit for you. We're not, you know, the perfect manager and maybe you should go, you know, left or right or wherever it might be. But I think that is, you know, what I sit back on maybe over 12 years and say, you know, we've made some real difference on, in our clients' lives. Um, and we've been candid and honest with them, sometimes to our own detriment, um, which is is probably not, you know, what, what we uh, would expect from a lot of groups. But I think that for me is probably something we're, I'm most proud of to to uh, to be able to help those clients. I, I completely agree with John. I think it, it, it's really important work that we do. I think I would add to it by saying, if you look kind of internally, you know, we've created a culture of innovation and engagement that is exciting and challenging and collaborative. Um, I'm really proud of that. You know, it's really fun to be working at a place where your colleagues are, you know, facing in the same direction, working for the same goals and challenging each other to do our best work. Uh, I think that's, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what else you could ask for in terms of a really kind of rich environment to work in. So you couple that with John's points around doing great work for clients and, and, you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to say anything. Yeah, well, but it's I, pretty good. Jackie and I've spent a lot of time in, in airplanes and rental cars <laughs> yeah. together uh, over twelve years, probably more than We've Jackie would like to care. Um, but I think it's, it's a lot of you know knowing each other's families, and I've had you know the great fortune of raising four kids uh, while since I've been in Hamilton Lane, and it's such a great place to be um, to be able to make it to baseball fields, and soccer fields, and uh, you know traveling a lot, but also enjoying those that you travel with. Um, and, and having some fun along the way, which we, we certainly try to do, uh, but enjoy each other's company with good people. How about the mentors, the people who have helped you along the way uh, that you can you can think of? From the first gentleman who hired me, um, Richard Mendoza, who's still a financial advisor down in Texas now, it sort of showed how to connect with clients. Uh, a lot of times around financial, uh, excuse me, kitchen tables and, uh, and around little conference rooms and, and trying to figure out, you know, exactly how do we help uh, those clients achieve their goals and what are their goals um, on a very, very personal level. Um, to, you know, my the, the two that hired me into the institutional space and, and Scott and Kevin from, from Turner, just really trying to know how to work hard, travel, um, but enjoy family um, as much as we possibly can. Uh, and then a lot of folks that we continue to work with, Jackie being one of them, that, you know, we, um, that we truly, truly find out how to do the right thing for a lot of our clients and for a lot of our families and, and really know what's important in life. Um, and that's, uh, that's truly important. Um, and I would, I would throw in my wife and kids who are uh, crazy at times, but also uh, <laughs> a, a very big source of inspiration for me, which is, uh, which is always fun. Yeah, I would um, echo what John says in a lot of ways. I mean, I was so lucky to start at Hamilton Lane so many years ago. There were so few of us and many are still there. So John and I are long tenured. There are a lot of long tenured people at Hamilton Lane. And so I got the chance to work with, you know, our now today co-CEOs, our, uh, our uh, executive chairman, um, you know, I, I got to work with them closely and learn from them. And, and I'm so Absolutely. grateful. Um, and, and many people, you know, John said it, we travel together. You ask the questions, you you double down and 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 check again or give me feedback. I mean, we'll get out of a meeting and, and give each other feedback. Yeah. I think all of that. So so it's a nice culture of that. And then it's the just the individual relationships that you have. I mean, I would also say, you know, I, I mentioned my family, I, you know, Certainly a family of 11, I saw incredible work ethic with my parents and, you know, my father in particular had that real love of learning and my brothers and sisters, you know, we're, we're all really hard workers. And so I value that and they've been mentors to me um, in a way that's so important. As John said, I, I have two, I have two college aid sons who, you know, challenge me and, um, acknowledge me and, um, all of the things, and, you know, it's so grateful. I mean, my husband, our, our family is very, very close. And I think just having that dynamic and having that, those types of relationships, you know, I, I, uh, I'm forever grateful. Every day. Congratulations to both of you on all of your success. Congratulations to Hamilton Lane on their continued success as well. Thank you for being in the studio here today. Thank, Thank you, you very much for Thank having you. us. Appreciate the time. If you want to learn more about John, Jackie, and Hamilton Lane, please visit their website at www.hamiltonlane.com. 
You can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast platform. We're also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. If you'd like to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're seeing and hearing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. We welcome your feedback as well. John and Jackie, thank you again for being here. And to our audience, thank you for investing your time with Dakota. Don't say goodbye.